Welcome to Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton, where we equip pastors to take their churches from declining to thriving by pointing them to a new future and a new hope. Join us weekly for encouragement and practical advice in your pastoring journey. And welcome to the next episode of Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. I'm Dan Hurst. There's Mark Clifton over there. Hey. And, uh, you know, we ha- – and there's Mark Halleck. But hey. before before we say anything, talk to Mark Halleck, <laughs> we're talking – last episode we talked a little bit about this and we're following up on that about this picture that's that's – been developed in North America about young people leaving their faith sooner than ever before. Now, what people don't know is that Mark Halleck has a ministry with young people, with he kids does. in particular. He does. Mark is a gifted pastor, but he's also a gifted pastor with children. He loves children, and yeah. children love him. And he's and got an al- two albums He has out. two albums of children's worship music that he has written and recorded. Yeah. Play, he, play a little bit of that. Here we go. Okay, guys. Here we go. Well, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Here we go. Okay, let me ask you a question. Crocodiles. <laughs> I love it. I love that. So God made everything we see. He made everything we crocodiles. see, including crocodiles. So that song could go on for a long time. Oh yes, because he and made everything that's, we see. That's exactly right. That's no. right. But here's the thing about it: what people don't know is that when he performs. He, he dresses like he a crocodile. dresses like a big giant bear. A bear? <laughs> a singing bear. Well, the, the bear is kind of the thing, you know? It's like, because I'm kind of like a big bear. You a are. Big, I'm kind of a big, you cuddly you, bear. You give bear hugs. And so I'm just sure. leaning in with that, throw on a, a bear head and get the guitar and <laughs> let's do this thing, man. Let's you know do what? this thing for you kiddos. You know what? Every kid in Denver would wish you were his pastor. Yeah, of course you would. Yeah, that is awesome. And what. now we're talking about why kids leave church. That's right. <laughs> and, and that song is one reason. No. Uh, check it out. It's called what? Uh, it's Songs from Joyland. Songs if you just go on Spotify, iTunes, whatever, just look up YouTube. Songs from Joyland. Song, it on YouTube? On YouTube. Yeah, yeah. just yeah, songs wherever. Songs from Joyland. All right, so last episode we talked about the, the really the changing dynamic that used to be if, if teenagers were going to sort of walk away from their faith, it was 18, 17, and then it became 14, or, but now it's 12. I mean, they're, they're leaving earlier because, as we talked about, go back and listen to the episode. Uh, it's all the pressure from social media, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, everything they're pressured on. The fact that it takes a lot more for them today to stand up and believe and, and speak the truth about biblical marriage and biblical sexuality – if they do that to their peers, they're going to be called hateful and bigoted, and it's a lot more costly for them than it was for a generation ago at 12 years old. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of reasons. But mm. today, man, we're going to dive into what are the factors the home can do and what are some things the church can do to help children, even at the age of 5, 7, 8, before they get to 12, mm-hmm. to really retain their faith yeah. and to have a solid basis. You know, one of the things we talked about, again, last episode was we, we send these 12, 14-year-olds out into the world, and they're faced with all of this information about transgender and gay marriage and everything else, and we've not really prepared them mm. doctrinally or any other way to, to understand why they believe what they believe. That's right, yep. And, man, the culture just sways them away. Yep. So we're going to look today at some factors. So, Mark, let's start with yep. first factors from the home. Yes. And number one factor in the home to help children maintain their faith is? Yep. Make sure dad is involved. Well, you're into this too. You you love. Oh man, this. you love this point. Oh man, I really do. I mean, you know, we we wrote down here, and it's true. The churches must do a better job of reaching and discipling dads, so that they can reach and disciple their kids. And we should never apologize for this in the church. You know what I mean? I, I in our church, we've tried to, by God's grace, create a culture where. <clears throat> Men understand it is a privilege and responsibility and joy to love their children and to disciple their children and to be goofy. You know, part of the thing with the music, which just, you know, part of it is I want to help set an example that to, to be goofy with your kids, you know, yes. to have fun with your kids, yes. to laugh with your kids, to sing with your kids. And, uh, you know, I, I tell you what, when I look at the kinds of dads that kids are drawn to, <laughs> They're those kind of dads, you right. know, uh, who have a childlike faith and love their kiddos. And so dads need to be involved. I mean, with with you guys, I mean, why would you say that's important? Well, I think we have to be intentional. Well, we know why it's important. I mean, obviously. All you got to do is, is look at a little boy and he tries to step mm-hmm. into his dad's shoes. 
and he wants to walk like his dad. Or you see a little boy or that will imitate his dad, or a little girl and how much she loves and idolizes her dad. And, and, and there's just so much we could say about that. And um, But what from our standpoint, though, from the church, you know, sometimes we take the path of least resistance many times. And let's be frank, sometimes it's just easier to minister to the mother than the dad, yeah. right? And there's an old book. It's been out for 20 years or more. There's some good stuff in it, maybe some not so good stuff in it, but the good stuff's worth looking at. It's called Why Men Hate to Go to Church. Mm. And it's written by a layman. And he thought, you know, it's just like church isn't something most men do. And he's Presbyterian, so it's a little different than us. But he's right. I mean, most of the time when you walk into a church building, the the sanctuary or the fellowship hall, it, it looks more like your grandmother's home hmm. than a man's lodge. Hmm. Why is that? Hmm. Not that there's something – not that if you just make it look like a man's lodge, all these young men are going to come. Yeah. But but what's what's the what's the, what's the what's the sort of the pressure yeah. to sort of – I hate to use this. I'm going to get in trouble, but sort of feminize even the right. church building. Yeah. You know, I go to a lot of nine churches, and they're full of silk flowers and silk plants. Well, they look pretty, mm. but if you're trying to reach 23-year-old men or 35-year-old yeah. men, I mean, that sort of sends a message that this mm. place isn't designed for mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you go to a church plant that's got a lot of young men, I don't see silk oh, plants. Oh, for sure. You know, I, no, I, no, I, you don't right. see anything like yep, that. Yep. You see other things, you know. As I, again, it's not the things that matter. It's, it's what— why we do those. Yep. <laughs> and it just takes a lot more work and a lot more patience yep. and a lot more intentionality to disciple a, a, a dad That's or right. a, a husband or a man yep. than it does many times the mother. Here's a, here's a practical thing that I would recommend doing. So one of the things we do at our church is, I you know, I was just a while back trying to figure out how do I get these guys reading books, reading good books? Because most guys are not reading books. They're reading blog posts or ESPN.com, which is all fine. But I said, man, I need to create something. So we literally started what I just call Men's Book Club. That's it. Really? Men's Book Club. And said, guys, I know you've probably never been part of a book club. Truth is, I haven't either. But this is going to be Men's Book Club. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to read one book a semester. So we read one book a semester. We meet once a month to come and you and come prepared to discuss Books on how to be a godly father, mm-hmm. how to be a godly husband, what it means to be a man. And, dude, you guys would be shocked at how many guys are part of this thing. But part of that is a pastor. You have to lead with vision and give guys a vision of who God's made them to be and then create environments where that can happen. And then that, that begins to change the culture. So I would say even in a dying mm-hmm. church, you know, if you got a handful of guys that you can do something like that with— Beyond just, listen, we all love the men's breakfast where you're right. kind of hanging out and right. you eat the pancakes. Or whatever. Right. This gives you a chance to actually talk about important things, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and guys can read. Men can read, yep. but they need to be, they need to be encouraged and, and pushed a little bit in, in a good way, you know. So, so absolutely, we need to focus on, on ministry to men, discipling men, being creative about how we do it just like you did. Because as far as a home factor goes, one of the primary factors that determine – whether or not young people wander away from their faith is the involvement of the dad. Now, we're saying that, and there's a tremendous number of, of uh, pastors who, who have incredible numbers of families in their churches with no father in the yes, home. Yes, that's right. Uh, he, 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 may be, he may be involved in the children's lives, but he's not in the home. They, they're divorced, or and they never were married, and that, that's a reality we have to face. And so in that in that regard again the church can be a place where some other men can have some influence yes. on these on these young people yep through all kinds of activities and yep. we just have to realize that's an important role we have you, know, you have two families you have your biological family you have your church family and particularly in those families where the biological father's not present for the for the men in the church to step up and, and make sure that you're you're being a model for those children is really important real quick as just a strategy um, and, you know, one of the things um, that I would recommend is what we'd call a shepherding team. Every, mm-hmm. every child in your church needs a shepherding team. And what it makes up a shepherding team, very basic, a parent. This is especially when we think about single moms, a pastor and a church member who all can work together in caring for this child. Like your church members, 
should be involved and see, even if they don't volunteer in the children's ministry, if Dan's in my church, I'm thinking, Dan, would you be part of my son's shepherding team? Would mm-hmm. you be? Would you pray for him? Would you take him out to breakfast once in a while? Could you come to watch his soccer games once right. in a while? Every kid needs that kind of team. And that's a way I think the church can come alongside single moms and those kids without a dad in an intentional way. Everybody's going to say it's important. Right. What I would say is, okay, what's your plan? Like, what's your strategy to actually meet that need? Right. So as we're talking about how to keep children um, from losing, from leaving the faith at a young age of 12, 14, which they seem to be doing in greater numbers, the first was in the home, make sure the dad's involved. Number two, enjoy church as a family, as a family, a family activity. And we talked about mm. this some last week, yeah. but the constant pressure to be divided at church. So you're over here and I'm over mm-hmm. here and... And you ever, listen, are you ready for this? If the only time your family talks about church at home is when you're criticizing Ooh, it, yeah. don't be surprised if your 12 or 14 year old wanders away from the faith. That's right. Because you, you've taught them to do totally. that. Totally. Yeah. And if you'll just be aware of how many times with the kids in the room you are critical of something at the church. Go ahead. What were you going to yeah, say? Yeah, well, I was just going to say this, and I think I've mentioned before, uh, especially for pastors, you have phone calls outside of your house. They, your kids don't need to overhear you having conversations because we're all on the phone a lot. They don't need to be hearing those. You step outside because that's you can poison your kids and your wife, quite frankly, with those calls. So it's like be aware of the tone in which you're sharing. I, I hope that our, our kids would hear from dad and mom, we love this church. Yeah. We love this. It's not perfect. But we love this church, and this is what it means to be part of it. And it's go ahead, It's our family doing this together. And we're doing it together. Right? Well, I think that's the key word in this one is it's not go to church as a family. It's enjoy church oh, enjoy. as a family. Yeah, enjoy. There's a, you can go and not enjoy it. Yeah, yeah that's true. And, and so you've got to find ways that that family enjoys mm-hmm. being there. And I would even recommend a dad's council where you've mm-hmm. got a, you know, a handful of men who get together and not only are they praying for their ministry mm-hmm. and praying for the church, but they're helping to come up with with activities like that. that that are focused on their family that they know their family mm-hmm. would enjoy yeah. doing. Yeah. That's a good That's word. really good. That's really awesome. good. Awesome. Okay, so three ways the home can impact this. Uh, make sure dad's involved. Enjoy church as a family, not just attend it. <laughs> That's yep. a great word. Yep. Thirdly, model and encourage really daily time in God's word. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, what does that look like? Model and encourage daily time in God's word. What, what in the world does that look like? Yeah. And um, I had a friend yesterday who said he, he drives his kids to school. They're like in uh, grade school. And he said, you know, it's not a big deal. He said, it's just, he says, it's our daily mm-hmm. bread. He said, I grew up with it. He said, mm-hmm. so they know. First, it was really weird. Now, he said, they actually look forward to it. Mm-hmm. Wow. Every morning yeah. on the way to school, one of them will read our daily bread, their little devotional. And the next day, the next one will read it. And it's just something we do every day on the way to school. That's mm-hmm. so cool. And he said, it's become a really sweet time, which is we, we schedule it. We know it. So daily in God's yeah. word. So they don't, they don't see it as something you do mm-hmm. only at church or only once in a while, yep. but but daily in God's Word. I'll tell you something that we started doing at, at, in, at, at our church is, um, you know, we've talked about this before, but I have every, every time we meet together, we have a time of Scripture reading, we have a time of prayer, and, um, and we, uh, we have a time of singing together, obviously. Well, that prayer, these, this is all led by people in the, in the church. Mm. <clears throat> and I will often ask, uh, a man, for example, to lead us in our morning prayer. And it's um, what I have found has happened is a lot of them, they're so excited about it that they'll invite their family to come in, mm. you know, and sit there while he, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, he's reading scripture, right? Mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and his kids are seeing that, you know, right. or he's praying out loud and his kids are seeing mm-hmm. that, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, what a way to connect wow. church yeah. And 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 uh, and family together. You know, our our dad is being I used by that. God. You know. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay, those are some home factors. There are many, but let's in the time we have remaining. Let's look at some factors that the church can do. And we we bumped into some of these already, yep. right? Yep. But you can foster an environment of trust by really giving young people legitimate ways to ask for help and to help them with real life issues. Yeah, yeah, that's good. To listen to them, to encourage yep. an openness where they can ask questions. 
so they, they don't make a disconnect and think, well, the church isn't really relevant to my life. Exactly. That's right. What are they dealing with in their life and how you could, because frankly, if you're a youth leader, you know, if all you're doing, bless your heart, is just trying to keep them entertained yep. and pizza and, yep. Yep. And, and whatever games and sports, and you're just trying to keep them out of trouble and that kind of thing, somebody is going to help these kids deal with life yep. issues. Yep. yep. It's either you or the world. That's but right. they're going to deal with them in one way or another. That's so right. go with the intentionality. Not only what are we teaching our children in terms of the information load we're giving them, but how are we teaching them to take that information mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and use it in life issues? Yeah, that's really good. It's really important. What's number two, Mark? Number two is youth workers have to go the extra mile to express <laughs> genuine concern for the individual young person, right? Not just the group. I think this is a distinction between, you know, kind of congregational level shepherding and personal or micro level shepherding. That's how we would talk about it at our church. Yes, you're ministering to a group of young people, but that group's made up of individuals. And we've got to understand that each sheep has different fears and and temptations and, um, you know, uh, loves and hates and fear, all the stuff. Anyway, point being, we need to be very intentional to go after individual sheep and young people. One of the ways you could do this, by the way, I think is as a pastor, is there an environment that you've created where young people in your church can just come and pick your brain about anything? You know what I mean? Is yeah. there is there like an envi- open mic type? Yeah, thing? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like come together in an environment, and and you say, listen, you could come, bring any question. I did. I, we did that. Uh, there's a church in Kansas City where the young pastor said, "I want to do this," and it's a it's an inner city church, um, uh, full of some of the most troubled neighborhoods mm-hmm. and troubled teenagers in Kansas City. And so he asked me, and he asked another pastor from one of the largest churches in the city to come. Right? And I thought, what was this about? Yeah, there's no yeah. agenda here. Just these teenagers can come and ask any questions they want. I go, what is it? He put a microphone down at the front in the aisle, and they lined up all – I'm not – all the way to the back door. To the, oh, the, I the, believe the, it. The whole – one after another. And the questions they ask us were profound. Yeah. And they were life issue questions. Yeah. Yeah. And, exactly. I mean, they wanted to hear what we had to say. Mm-hmm. It really blew me. I've never forgotten that. Wow. Yeah. So I, I think kids do want to know more. I think the idea of a question and answer time is a great thing. Yeah. The other thing about being in youth work, there are some kids that are just easier to shepherd than others. Right, right. You know, some want to hang out with you. So mm-hmm. you end up spending all of your time, yeah. if you're a Sunday school teacher or a worker, with this kid that wants to hang out and wants to do things with you. And, all. and then there's these other kids over here that just don't really connect. And unless you are intentional about connecting to them— yep. They're not going to, and they're the ones that are going to feel like, well, they didn't really care for me like they care for mm, the other kid. That's exactly Trust right. me. Yep. When that kid who seems like he doesn't really care to be talked to, he's just mm-hmm. sitting over there, he doesn't want to be bothered, when he sees you doting over the kid who wants to be, he makes in his mind or her mind yeah. the idea that he cares a lot more about him than me. That's right. That's and right. I think you just have to be very, very cautious about that. You know, that. one of the things that we did in, in when I was down in, in Florida, uh, we started what we called uh, – um, uh, it was it was uh, youth. I can't remember the name of it now. Youth, basically youth missions. And what would happen is we would we had our youth ministry, and every one of those not every one of those kids, but a large of them had been one on one discipled, maybe mm. for two three years. And then the, the idea was now you need to go disciple somebody, you mm-hmm. know, Second Timothy two two type thing. And then we would take a group. We'd go to a, a church. And say maybe he only had a dozen kids in their mm-hmm. youth group. We'd take a dozen kids, girl on girl, guy on guy would would disciple them for the weekend, mm-hmm. and then I would work with the youth workers and, and parents, whoever wanted to work with me, and and disciple them. But the reason we got that idea was, I realized there were more kids that I wasn't able to reach uh, on a one to one basis, but the kids could reach them, mm-hmm. and so That's I good. encouraged the kids to start discipling those kids that were not really reachable for me. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's something that, you know, that you, you know, you've got a couple of young people that's in great. your church yeah. that uh, they're ready to start ministering. And this is a great way for them to yep. do that is to connect with the, the unreachable ones in, in, within your realm of ministry. I love it. Just, just realize, man, you can't yeah. overlook any of those sheep. That's right. That's right. Thirdly, get them involved with more adults. Find multi-generational ministries yeah. and mark 
we yep. got to hurry here. Yep. But once again, lay on us the multi generational discipleship model. This is worth the price yeah. of the podcast yeah. <laughs> right here. Well, you know, I mean, if you if you look at the history of Cal- of our revitalization work at Calvary, you know, you you've got to do the best you can with who you've got. And one of the things from the very beginning is we started multi generational discipleship groups where we would have. Uh, a young person, and then typically maybe one of their parents, and then an older person in the congregation. Uh, just women groups, guy groups. And here's what I can tell you is the stories that came out of that, the way that our congregation fell in love with one another in a multi-generational way, right? So all of a sudden, it's like you've got a young family who's starting to come, and that little girl is is friends with Miss Debbie, whose husband died five years ago, and now they're sitting together in the pew for worship, I think this is in a dying church. You have to figure out ways to celebrate and actually intentionally help create an environment of multi-generational connection, encouragement, love, and ministry. And small discipleship groups can be a way Mm -hmm. to do that. Um, Listen, kids don't need more time with kids their own age. I mean, they've got a lot of that. What they need is wisdom and, and of those who are older. And guess what? Older folks in the church, they need young people in their life as well. We know a lot of things about the first century church, and one of the things we know, it was a multi-generational church. That's right. Yeah. As Paul tells Timothy how to deal with multi-generations. Okay, quickly, number four, create some rites of passage. I'll just do this really quick. Our friend Andy Addis, he has some rites of passage for young men. I can't remember if it's age of 12 or 14, but when they get to that age, they completed some stuff in the church. They bring them up before the church. Say, you know, you're moving to manhood. That, that sense that you belong here. A lot of times at the age of 12 or 14, I don't know where I belong in the church mm-hmm. anymore. Yeah. And, and I think Andy does a good job of creating some rites of passage that say, you belong here and you're part of our community, both with girls and boys. In and it. does that give them a goal for uh, yes. to, to move on? To, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So be thinking about what that looks like. And then finally, let them have some real leadership, yeah. even as a young person. Yeah. You know, we always, and it's good. We see young people working the soundboard or work in the yeah. computer. And that's great, right? But mm. there are other things they can do and yeah. find other things that they can be a part of. That's right. And the more you can involve them early on, the more they will interact with older adults, the more they'll feel part of the church, the more they'll be open up to other yeah. people to talk to them about what's going on. All those things are good. All of this to say, please, children are, are, are walking away from their faith and giving up on their faith at an earlier age than ever before. And it's incumbent on us to realize the nature of the work we're in and to be very intentional about addressing that both in the home and in the church and not to just to let it slide and have a laissez-faire attitude. Well, what will be will be. They are our sheep. That's right. And we must go after them. Amen. Well, that wraps up today's episode. I hope it's been informative. There's a lot of stuff we've covered. My goodness. I mean, we've covered something like eight points here. So, um, but then Clifton can talk a lot. And so we can, we, can, we can get through it. I hope it's been beneficial for you. And I hope that you'll plan on joining us again on our next episode of Revitalize and Replant with Mark Clifton. Thanks for joining us today on Revitalize and Replant. This podcast is brought to you by the North American Mission Board where we help dying or struggling churches regain health for the glory of God and the good of their communities. If you found this conversation helpful, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. To learn more about becoming a replanting pastor or to explore resources about revitalization for your own church, visit churchreplanters.com.